Studies in the Gospel of Mark. W. J. Hawking. 27. The Petition of Jarius. 1913-211 And when Jesus had crossed over, see note 1, again in the boat, see note 2, unto the other side, a great multitude was gathered, see note 3, unto him, and he was by the sea. And there cometh, see note 4, one of the rulers, see note 5, of the synagogue, Jarius by name, see note 6, and seeing him, see note 7, he falleth, see note 8, at his feet, and beseecheth, see note 9, him much, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death, see note 10, I pray thee, that thou come, see note 11, and lay thy hands, see note 12, on her, that she may be made whole, see note 13, and live. And he went, see note 14, with him, and a great multitude, see note 15, followed him, and they thronged, see note 16, him, verse 21 to 24, RV. Note 1. Having passed over, JND, was crossed over, MCC. Note 2. Ship, JND, Bark, TSG. Note 3. Crowd gathered, JND, TSG, multitude gathered. Note 4. Comes, JND, TSG. Note 5. Chiefs, TSG. Note 6. By name, Jarius, JND, TSG. Note 7. When he saw, MCC. Note 8. Falls down, JND, falls, TSG. Note, note 9. Besought, MCC, beseeches, TSG. Note 10. At extremity, JND, at her last gasp, TSG. Note 11. I pray, that thou shouldest come, JND, I pray thee come, MCC, it is that thou mayest come, TSG. Note 12. Lay hands, TSG. Note 13. Healed, JND, TSG, saved, MCC. Note 14. Went away, MCC, TSG. Note 15. Large crowd, JND, great crowd, TSG. Note 16. Pressed on, JND, were thronging, TSG end of notes. At this point in the course of the Gospel narrative, events in Capernaum are introduced which illustrate yet another phase of the ministry of Jehovah's servant, exercised in connection with Israel. It will be recalled from what precedes that, 1, the parables in the fourth chapter, 2, the stilling of the storm in the presence of the apostles alone, and, 3, the healing of the demoniac in Gadara beyond Jordan, all combine to instruct the followers of Christ concerning the singular nature of the ministry of the kingdom. Taking the three points as enumerated, it is shown, 1, that the word of God as preached by the Lord would not be immediately and invariably successful in fruit-bearing, 2, that the difficulties in opposition to the gospel would sometimes be so great that the servants of the kingdom would be in danger of complete destruction, 3, and that the witnesses of Christ may expect to be left alone in a world that had rid itself of the presence of the servant of Jehovah himself. Evidence is now furnished by the raising of Jairus' daughter of the positive nature of the Lord's gracious mercy in his ministry which was then proceeding. Jesus was the Lord of life and death. And let Israel be so dead in all spiritual perception as to be oblivious to the advent of the Messiah, he would, in answer to faith, bestow life upon the dead. Moreover, if only touched in faith he was ready to respond in, in healing power to the weak and ailing. The Lord came to save Israel's life though the condition of the nation in reality proved to be death when he came. But beside this main purpose such was the fullness of grace that wherever there was faith in the midst of the surrounding crowd, healing flowed forth from the fountain of mercy present. Another new feature of divine ministry is introduced in that the incident shows that the Lord was accessible on behalf of others. A person whose name, in contrast with the usual practice in the Gospels, is recorded, see note 1, approached the prophet to solicit mercy for his daughter. In the instances mentioned previously, the Lord dealt directly with the persons whom he blessed, and though it is recorded that the inhabitants of Capernaum brought their disease to Jesus for healing, 132, and that the sick of the palsy was born to him by four, nothing is stated of any intercession being made by the interested friends of the afflicted. Here the parental anxiety of Jairus for his only daughter who lay dying is manifest in the earnest solicitude of his petition for her recovery. We are shown how Jesus graciously responded to this request but most striking of all is that part of the narrative which contains the words of comfort and assurance addressed to the agitated father upon the receipt of the news that his daughter had died before Jesus reached the house, b. 
be not afraid, only believe. See Note 2. Note 1, Luke also records the ruler's name, but not Matthew. The Hebrew equivalent of Jarius occurs in Numbers 32 41 and Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 3 verse 14. Note 2, it has been suggested that Jarius was one of the rulers who came to Jesus on behalf of the centurion who built a synagogue at Capernaum, Luke 7 verse 5. This is no more than conjecture, but if true, the Jewish ruler had not the faith of the Roman soldier, who expressed the confidence that the Lord need not come to his house but could heal his servant with a word only. End of notes. We thus have illustrated that feature of the ministry of the servant of Jehovah which is of such value in a world of suffering and sorrow, still groaning beneath the distressing effects of the presence of sin. The previous portion of the gospel demonstrated that the word of Jesus had power to heal disease, to deliver from Satan, and to still the storm. Here it is displayed that the servant had come to administer the word of comfort which was suited to sustain the wounded spirit until the actual deliverance is effected. Such words of support and cheer are specially needed by those who walk by faith and not by sight. The Chronological Order it may be of some interest to inquire in what chronological order this miracle occurred, though it is admitted that as a general rule the exact order of occurrence is a point of subsidiary importance in the reading of the Gospels, and in many instances the notes of time given in the narratives are altogether inadequate as determining factors in settling the chronology. In examining such indications of relative order as exist in this case, it is found that by Mark and Luke the healing of the healing of Jairus's daughter is placed in immediate juxtaposition to the Lord's return from Gadara, while in the first gospel the two events are separated by the healing of the sick of the palsy, the call of Levi, the feast in his house, and the conversations with the Pharisees and with the disciples of John the Baptist. Is it then possible to ascertain the exact sequence of these various events? In the narrative of Matthew it is shown distinctly that the Lord's words to John's disciples about the piece of cloth and the wineskins were immediately followed by the petition of Jairus. It is there stated that while he yet spake these things unto them, behold, there came a ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, Matthew 9 verse 18. Now this interview with the disciples of the Baptist was held in Levi's house where the newly called apostle had made a feast in honor of Jesus, inviting many publicans and sinners to be present. And it was the social standing of these guests which awakened the contempt of the Pharisees, Matthew 9 verses 11 to 13. Now it is to be noticed further that the objection made by the Pharisees to the character of these guests immediately preceded the visit of John's disciples. This is determined by the connective phrase, then, tote, come to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? Matthew 9 verse 4. At this juncture, therefore, while the conversation was proceeding in Levi's house, Jairus came, and in response to his request, Jesus left the house of feasting to visit the house of mourning. The cure of the sick of the palsy and the call of Levi precede the feast, in Matthew's account. See note. They are there interpolated for topical reasons, since the strict order of occurrence, in the case of the first two events, is shown by Mark and Luke to have been before the Lord crossed the Sea of Gadara. Although in all three Gospels the notice of the feast which Levi made immediately follows that of his call, this position in no way proves that the feast was arranged on the same day. Some time would be necessary to make preparations and to invite the guests. But though the call and the feast were not immediately consecutive in the happening of events in Capernaum, they are placed together in the narrative to show that one was the outcome of the other, the feast expressed the gratitude of the tax gatherer to him who had called him. Note, in Mark 2 verses 15 to 22 the feast and the encounter with the Pharisees are named earlier in the narrative, and thus out of chronological sequence. Such an arrangement is unusual with this evangelist. In the words of another, it is one of the exceptional dislocations, if not the only one, in Mark, for it would appear from Matthew 9 verse 18, that while the Lord was speaking of the wine and the bottles the ruler Jairus came about his daughter. End of note. The Lord's journey across the sea to the country of the Gerasenes does not appear to have occupied more than 24 hours. He seems to have left Capernaum towards the evening of one day, and returned in the course of the next. And the sequence of the events that immediately ensued was probably as follows, the last four taking place in the house of Levi. 1. 1. The return from Gadara by boat. 2. The welcome of Jesus by crowds on landing. 3. The Feast in the House of Levi. 
4. The criticism of the Pharisees. 5. The question by the disciples of John the Baptist. 6. The application of Jairus concerning his child. Dying or dead. In comparing the three accounts of this incident it is observable that the words of Jairus to the Lord appear to be reported differently. In these reports Matthew and Mark give the language used by the ruler, while Luke records them in the third person, thus we read. Matthew my daughter is even now dead, 918. Mark my little daughter is at the point of death, verse 23. Luke she lay a dying, 842. The ostensible difference is that according to the first evangelist Jairus told the Lord that his daughter was actually dead, but according to Mark and Luke it would seem that she was at death's door. This variation is in itself an unimportant one, especially as we learn from the Gospels that a messenger brought the news of the child's actual death, while Jesus was on the way to the ruler's house a circumstance, be it observed, not named by Matthew who represents the daughter's death from the outset of his narrative. Apart from an explanation, this difference is valuable inasmuch as it proves the absence of collusion between the several evangelists, but the antagonists of the Gospels have made much of this so-called discrepancy, alleging that their credibility is weakened if not destroyed thereby. But it is quite possible to justify both expressions, and to produce more than one reasonable explanation of the difference in phraseology. As already remarked, the Synoptic Gospels were evidently not written in collaboration to satisfy the demands of critics that they should be in exact mechanical alignment. And indeed the remarkable brevity of these memoirs is such that difficulties like that now under consideration are inevitable. The severe compression of both matter and style is phenomenal. Consider the comparative length of the Gospels as biographies. In an ordinary octavo Bible, with double columns of references, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke occupy about 40 pages each, John about 30, and Mark about 25 pages only. And these slight pamphlets constitute the sole authentic memoirs of the life and ministry of the incarnate Son of God whose public service was characterized by incessant activity. How insignificant these seem in point of size when compared with the ponderous biographical tomes of the world's non-entities. Confessedly, brevity is one of the striking features of the Divine Gospels. Bearing this characteristic in mind it will be admitted to be impossible, under such stringent restriction, that the whole of the minor details necessary to a complete picture of a given incident should be recorded. A selection must be made, subject, of course, to the purpose of the narrative, and the briefer the allotted space the more extensive the exclusion must become. Thus each evangelist in his selection, under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, was governed by the special object before him, and not by the details recorded by his fellow evangelists, with whose compilation he may or may not have been familiar. In other words, each writer was, in this sense, independent. 1913-229 Now in the incident under consideration, if we were in possession of the whole of the events of that day the particulars recorded would fall into their due chronological order and the apparent discordance would disappear. However, without claiming that the following hypothesis has a historical basis, an examination of the various accounts will reveal phrases which afford strong probability to the explanation advanced. And this explanation, it is believed, will be sufficient to meet the demands of even this case, which has been described as the most perplexing difficulty in the whole of the gospel history. 1. In the accounts of Mark and Luke we read that Jairus came to the Lord after he had landed and while he was still near the lake, and he was by the sea. And there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, synagogue, etc., and as Jesus returned, the multitudes welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, etc., Mark 5 verses 21-22, Luke 8 verse 41. In the absence of direct proof to the contrary, it seems clear that before the Lord went to the feast of Levi he received the petition of the ruler who besought him much to come and lay his hand upon his little daughter who was at the point of death. 2. Matthew describes the Lord as seated in Levi's house and instructing the disciples of John the Baptist on the question of fasting when Jairus presented his request, while he spake these things unto them, Behold, there came a ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, Matthew 9 verses 18 to 19. It has already been noted that this interrupted interview with the Baptist's disciples took place in the house of Levi, it would seem therefore that Matthew, in his account, is not referring to the occurrence chronicled by the other two evangelists, but relates how the anxious ruler sought the Lord's presence a second time.
If this was so, we must suppose that the Lord did not respond at once to the first prayer of Jarius, even as in his perfect wisdom he did not immediately respond to the urgent message of the sisters of Bethany concerning Lazarus. Therefore while Jesus was at the feast, Jarius renewed his petition in somewhat altered terms. He had become impatient at the seeming delay of the Master. She who at his first application was at her last gasp had by this time died. This he may have judged from her condition when he left her. At any rate he seems on the second occasion to have worded his request from this point of view. My daughter is even now dead, was his plea this time. Yet even in this extremity. There remained in his heart hope and trust in the great physician, for he added, Come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. The Lord tarried no longer, but arose, arose, an expression not found in the parallel passages, and followed him. The fact of the damsel's death was subsequently confirmed by the messenger. The child was dead, and the mourners were already in the house, why should the master be troubled further? Thus ran the message. Viewed in this light, the terms of the petition of Jarius as stated by Matthew are in perfect accord with those recorded by Mark and Luke, and no further remarks are necessary. But it may be added that some have questioned whether the precise meaning of the original phrase in Matthew is conveyed by the usual rendering, my daughter is even now dead. It is to be remarked that the verb used here is edilitizen and not the same as that employed by the messenger, apathane, moreover, the adverb is not none, but arty, which may be translated, just about to happen, Revelation 12 verse 10. There is not the precision in the coincidence of time indicated by arty as by vv5. Such a distinction between these adverbs may be observed in John 2. Speaking at Cana of the waterpots, the Lord said to the servants at the marriage feast, Draw out now, none, i.e., draw out at this very moment. Later, the ruler of the feast, having tasted the wine, said to the bridegroom, Thou hast kept the good wine until now, arty, i.e., until the conclusion, as opposed to the commencement of the feast. There is less exactitude of time implied in the latter than in the former instance. But it is doubtful whether this distinction in usage is invariably observed in the New Testament, and it is only named here for the consideration of students. Many translators have attributed this greater latitude of meaning to this adverb in the phrase in question, as if Jarius had said, My daughter by this time has come to her end. This is in agreement with Mr. Darby's rendering, My daughter has by this died. In a footnote to the translation he adds, Arty is what comes up to none, says Suedas, quoted by Wettstein in Loco, as Attica, what in the future joins now? Mark has is at extremity, Luke was dying. Nor has now died any other sense, only it is less clear. It is, however, quite possible that Matthew may give the result of the servant's message and all. It may be translated, has just now died, or, has even now died. Chrysostom and others give it as in text, that is, has by this died. In another place, see note, Mr. Darby wrote, R.D. Edel, now at her end, dead by this. We know that the father received the news that she was actually dead on the way. Arty is the point up to which time reached, none the thing exists already. Note, Collected Writings, Vol. 24. Page 209. End of note. The Father's Petition. It is noticeable that the prominent person in this episode was not one of the common people, as was the case in the events narrated in the former part of this gospel history. Jarius, the petitioner, was a man of social and religious eminence, and moreover of that class from which the active opposition to Jesus sprang. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were honorable exceptions, but of the rest, it was once scornfully asked, have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? John 7 verse 48. Here then the Lord's mercy to the ruler shows that he is rich towards all who call upon him, and that the testimony of good works which Capernaum was so obdurate in refusing, Matthew 11 verse 23, ranged throughout all grades from the chiefs of the synagogue downwards. Jarius, coming to Jesus in his distress, did him reverence by falling at his feet, a mark of respect the more striking, coming, as it did, from a person of local distinction such as a ruler of the synagogue was. The trouble of Jarius concerned his affections as a parent. He had one only daughter about twelve years of age, and she lay a dying. He therefore kept beseeching the Lord that he would come to his house and lay his hand upon her and heal her. 
Did the ruler recollect that in that very town not so long before, Jesus had entered the house of Simon where his wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and taking her by the hand, lifted her up and healed her? At any rate, such was the request he made. But Jesus did hot immediately go to the sick child, for he was never swayed by secondary considerations. Personal friendship did not hurry him to the sick man at Bethany and his sorrowing sisters, John 11 verses 3 and 36. His movements then, as ever, were regulated as to time and place only by the glory of God which would accrue. In this case he who would pause in his progress at the cry of a blind beggar by the roadside was not to be induced to alter his plans because a chief of the synagogue knelt at his feet. The ruler might have supposed that the party of tax gatherers at Levi's house might very well wait until his own case was dealt with. But Jehovah's perfect servant was above all such motives of worldly policy. He himself was learning obedience by the things he was suffering, here was an opportunity for Jarius also to learn a lesson of patience and submission to the will of God. And thus his sorrow and anxiety over his daughter would be turned to account in his spiritual development. He would become possessor of that inward peace which is the result of patient submission to the divine will. For this priceless boon we shall all do well to pray. Drop thy still dues of quietness. Till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress. And let our ordered lives confess. The beauty of thy peace. Jesus then arose from the table of Levi and accompanied the sorrow-stricken ruler. The disciples of the Lord went with him, and a crowd of people also followed him and thronged him as he passed through the narrow winding thoroughfares of Capernaum.